Good afternoon. I'm John Secondari. During the last 14 years, this nation has donated more than $50 billion to some 60 nations in foreign aid. That's a little bit less than it takes us to run the government of this country for one year. So that if it seems that if we formed a habit of giving aid, it is also true that we have formed the habit of bitterly arguing about it. Foreign aid has been called by its opponents the most diabolically clever method of economic suicide ever conceived. Its defenders claim that foreign aid is the greatest act of statesmanship of a great nation. That means us. In any case, foreign aid shows no sign of abating. This year, the administration is asking for more than $4 billion of it in its budget. In our studio to ha today, we have three of the outstanding experts on foreign aid and what it means. There are Mr. Eric Johnston, Chairman of Committee for International Cono Economic Growth and the President of the Motion Picture Association of America. We have the Honorable S.K. Patil, Minister of Food and Agriculture of the Government of India, and we have Congressman John J. Rhodes, Republican of Arizona. Therefore, foreign aid, what does it do, what does it not do? Whom does it do good for and whom does it hurt? That's what we'll talk about today. The ABC Television Network presents from Washington, D.C., Open Hearing, a program dedicated to public service. Here again is your host, John Secondari. Mr. Johnston, I'm going to ask you the first question. Do you think we should go on with foreign aid, sir? Well, of course. There's no question about that. We have to go on with foreign aid. Foreign aid is in two parts, you know. Part of it is military, about half that we're giving now. The other is so-called economic aid. I think there's no question that we must strengthen the frontiers of freedom uh, around the world, both militarily and economically. There's no other alternative that we have. Congressman Rhodes? Well, I would uh, give a qualified yes. Actually, the uh, greatest asset of the free world is the free American economy. If anything should happen to disturb the free American economy or to endanger it, then uh, wh whether we have built highways in Burma or whether we have uh, produced plants to make fertilizer in Korea or, or things of that nature, I think would be strictly secondary. We have to, uh, in other words, work this whole program as we do other programs into the warp and woof of uh, the American economy. And uh, I would say that this program should continue as long as it uh, is necessary for the welfare of the free world, but only also so long as the American economy can take the, the brunt of the situation as it now exists. Now, Mr. Patil, what do you say as the representative of a nation that has been receiving some economic aid? As one of the receiving nations, I feel I'm not qualified to say whether it is necessary that it should continue or not. But if I were a citizen of the United States of America, I could feel that it's very necessary that it should continue. It has done plenty of good in the world. If the United States is uh, popular, and it's getting more popular year after year, and if it's drawn nearer to the hearts of millions of people in these undeveloped countries, it is this aid that is doing that. Well, as a citizen of India, do you feel that economic aid from the United States should continue? I feel so, because after all, this aid aids us to stand on our legs. It isn't a permanent affair. There are in this world two sets of countries, developed countries, undeveloped countries. You can't enjoy your prosperity, even in your own self-interest, unless the rest of the world comes to the position of appreciating that enjoyment. And surely I would feel that uh, it's a direction uh, which should be continued. Mr. Rhodes, it seems to me that in your answer to the question, uh, you implied that perhaps we were doing ourselves damage at the same time that we're doing others good. Is that right? Well, I think that's a distinct possibility that we have to consider. And bear in mind, this program has to be justified year after year. I mean, each year and uh, each part of the program. There is too much of a tendency to oversimplify this, this program and to say that it's either good or it's bad, uh, whereas parts of it are very good and parts of it are very bad. 
So uh, it, it's a great danger, which we have in the country today, to become over-emotional about it. Uh, I look at it, or at least I try to look at it, as something which uh, I have to appropriate money for as an elected representative, uh, appropriate the taxpayers' money for their benefit. In other words, this program to me has to benefit the American taxpayer or it's no good. As far as charity is concerned, charity is wonderful, but it has to be voluntary. And uh, there's certainly nothing voluntary about uh, paying your taxes. So as a constitutional officer, I think I have to determine that this program, or all parts of it, uh, are doing the taxpayer some good or otherwise. Uh, if it's just charity, then it should be carried on through the usual charitable organizations and Mr. not through Rhodes, the Congress of the United States. Mr. Rhodes, I remember the saying that charity begins at home. And I believe charity does begin at home. But I don't think this is charity in any form, sense, or, or, or viewpoint. As a matter of fact, the world is in a very desperate struggle to remain free. The world will remain free only if people can make progress under a free society in which they have freedom of choice. Now, the nations of the world that are less developed nations, the nations that are in a period of takeoff and can make economic growth, those nations are going to make that economic growth either under a system of freedom or under a system of slavery. I hope they make it under a system of freedom. And if they make it under a system of freedom, then the United States can remain free. And that's what our military appropriations are about. We spend over $40 billion a year on the military alone, and why do we spend it? Because we're in a great conflict with a different ideology called communism. And if that I ideology succeeds in the world, then anything else that we do at home, any domestic problem that we have, is completely overshadowed and perhaps completely done away with if communism succeeds. Nations of the world like India are trying to make progress under a system of freedom. If they cannot make progress under a system of freedom, I believe the minister will tell you right here today that they'll make progress under a communist system of slavery or some other form of dictatorship. We want these nations to be free to make their own choice, whatever that choice may be, and to change that choice if they wish to do it. And they can only do that, in my opinion, if they're making economic progress under a system of freedom. That's the struggle to me. It isn't charity. There's nothing charitable about this. We're saving, in one sense, the freedom of the world, which is our freedom, too. In other words, we're making an investment. I think a very... I think we're making a major investment. In my opinion, an investment which is going to pay tremendous dividends as time goes on. Well, well Mr. Johnston, your, uh, uh, your objectives wouldn't differ from mine in the least. Uh, when I said charity, of course, I intended to, to say that there are certain uh, portions of this program which probably aren't in the best interest of the taxpayer of the United States, and if there are, we should cut those out. But I agree that uh, as far as our taxpayer is concerned, it is to his interest to make sure that this world uh, remains free or at least that they, it has the choice to remain free. So I don't want anybody to think that there's any difference in our objectives. There certainly is not. The only difference is that I do not look on this program as an end in itself. Uh, I look on it, on it as, a, as an adjunct of policy. And uh, the policy is that policy which is best calculated to uh, accomplish the uh, thing for which the American taxpayer thinks he's paying his tax money, and that is to try to get a world which is safe for freedom doesn't it all come down to a question of goals? What do you think the goals should be on this, on this foreign aid program? Should there be well-specified goals? Oh, I think there should be. And as a matter of fact, I think as we go along in the program, we're evolving goals, which probably we didn't have in the inception. I think the goals are, first, we must determine those nations which are in a growth period, which are beginning to accumulate savings. And nations which can go forward. It's difficult to do something with a completely aboriginal society, but we can do things with people who want to make progress and who have the inherent spirit to do so. And there are many nations of that kind today. Those nations should be helped the most. Then I further believe that we should put great stress on agricultural development in these nations, not just industrialization alone, as important as that is. Agricultural development and technical development by technical development, I mean training technicians in these countries to do the job themselves. That seems to me is a very important part of this whole program. Yours yes, is agricultural yes, I was going to say something about it. Uh, I think Mr. Eric Johnston has took the right note when he said that. Now look our case, India. We are by far the largest democracy in this world. We happen to be so because our numbers are so large. Now, having made a democratic constitution, because we believe in it, it isn't merely a constitution to us, it's a way of our life. 
Now you want to strengthen the foundations of this democracy. There are elements in our country that would want democracy destroyed as quickly as possible. And if we want to make it a success, then surely those foundations have got to be built. They must be made unshakable, unassailable. How do you make it? Unless at the same time we also work for the economic progress of the millions of masses who merely won't be content because they have got a democracy, but it must be also equated with rising standards of life, prosperity. And that's why normally we could do so, but it would take a long time to do so. The world is moving fast, and therefore these things have got to be accomplished oh, as quickly as we can. That's why this aid comes very handy to us, because it enables us to do in 15 years what otherwise it would require 50 years to do. And that means we make a progress in the direction of democracy, and which is a good ideal for everybody. Well, I put in a jarring note, but uh, I, I think I must. Uh, I certainly agree with the minister that, that uh, India is a great democracy, and anything we can do to help India maintain that democracy and expand it, I am for. However, uh, India certainly is a, a country which needs a lot of development, and I submit to you, Mr. Patil, and I think you'll agree with me that there isn't enough money in the United States to force all of India into the mid-20th century overnight. In other words, it, it, it is very necessary that we pace the aid which we give, not only to India, but to the other countries, and, uh, and give it to the country as the country can absorb it. It's like giving a blood transfusion. You don't give it too fast or the patient will die. So uh, uh, one of the objections I have to the program, this, this particular program and the people administering to it, is that I think too many times we are in the business of trying to find ways in which we can help people that those people never thought of themselves. Uh, we have people who are dedicated to expanding this program. I think more than it needs to be expanded. That's one of the businesses of Congress, to try to hold the program within the limits which we can afford and the limits which we, have, we think are sensible. Now, I don't say that this is wrong. I think every good program should have its advocates. And I would be the first to agree that uh, this program should have its advocates. But uh, I want it understood also that in Congress we find it very difficult sometimes to hold the program down to the to what we think the patient can absorb. In other words, to realistic goals. That's is right. Is that correct? That's well, correct. In this modern world, built as it is, isn't it also, isn't politics also one of the realities? Do you believe that there should be any political qualification to our foreign aid? Well, I think by the very nature of things that there would be some political qualification. In other words, we're not going to give aid to somebody who is completely dedicated to the other side. Uh, I, I might say also that as far as the Soviet blockade is concerned, uh, there are political uh, strings attached to it. Uh, I, of course, I, this is a subject in itself. I think the Soviet blockade is the greatest misnomer of the 20th century. But anyhow, uh, I would say that the aid ought to be uh, a, a minimum as far as this political strings are, are concerned. But by the very nature of the thing, there are going to be some, and I think everybody recognized it. Do you agree with that, Mr. Patel? Of course. So far as the political strings are concerned, I would say that a country like India would not like any aid from anybody if there are any political strings. But that does not mean that you know anybody has a right to expect money as a matter of course from the United States of America. Surely, I could quite understand and agree with the uh, with Mr. Rose that it is so. But in a country like, democratic country like India, our objective being common and the same, I don't think that there are any political strings whatsoever. But it becomes a very, a kind of a natural aid for the same objective for which the United States of America. It's certainly true that we, we have no strings on uh, the aid as far as India is concerned, and India wouldn't accept it if we did. However, all I meant, uh, Mr. Minister, was that we, we do like to have friendliness in exchange for aid. We do agree, for aid. I do agree oh, with we don't, uh, we don't want somebody to come out and say we're on your side forever and a day, but we uh, would like to have them at least say we like you and we think you're good people. Oh, you're perfectly right. Well, I, Mr. Rose, I don't like to be the devil's advocate, but uh, we really do give some assistance and aid to people who are really on the other side. Look at the aid we give to Poland. Uh, look at the aid we give to Yugoslavia. Mr. Tito, whom I have met, met and talked to, is a dedicated communist. Now, we're doing that because Tito has shown his uh, independence from Moscow and the Kremlin. We're doing it in Poland for a different set of political reasons. 
So we, we have, uh, I don't think you can divorce politics from this completely, but I, I think that the, our aid program has been given to try to get people into a position where they have freedom of choice or to help them have that freedom of choice. Now, I quite agree with one other thing that you said, Mr. Rhodes, and that is that we don't want to force feed somebody or give them more blood in their veins than they can absorb. And I don't really know much of those instances. I think there's some times when we have given aid for political purposes and have done things to try to keep a regime in power because we didn't know any other regime that could take a power. And maybe there'd be chaos if that regime wasn't in power. We've done those things, perhaps, and maybe we shouldn't have. But in general, I don't think we've given more aid than they can absorb. Usually quite the contrary. Usually they can absorb a great deal more than we're able to give them. May I ask you a question of the, of the minister? Please do. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Patil, uh, I've heard so much about Soviet aid, and uh, I'm a member of the Foreign Operations Subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee. And uh, we have been trying to find instances where the Soviet have actually given anybody anything. Uh, we think we may have an instance where they have given India uh, an oil refinery or something of that nature, but that's one of the few instances that we know of, or that we think we know of. Now, uh, could you tell what you know about Soviet aid as, uh, uh, as a person who is in a government which has had some contact with it? As you know, Mr. Rose, India is friendly to everybody. Yes, sir. But so far as the aid goes, we have received the largest aid from the United States of America. Of course, the Soviet aid also sometimes comes for something. Mr. Khrushchev came to India. He gave some agricultural implements in a place and we had a big farm because the implements were given. He also gave some money. I do not exactly remember the quantum of it just now, but surely for some specific purposes. But so far, as our developmental plan is concerned, we more discuss it with the United States and other friendly countries, especially the Commonwealth countries. They pool their resources together, and surely we do not get as much as we need. But we quite understand that we must be able to stand on our own legs, and we mustn't look to the rest of the world that they will come and complete our plans. Our plans must, must not be so impracticable that we ourselves would not be able to complete them. The difference is that we look to you and to the Western countries more than to anybody else for the successful implementation of those plans. In so general, Mr. Congressman and Mr. Minister, we're now loaning money and not giving it. Yeah. You know, many years ago, several years ago, I advocated the Development, uh, development Loan Fund. Uh, I think we're much better off to loan money than to give it away because the recipient country understands a loan and he doesn't understand a gift. Uh, it may be a very soft loan and a loan at a very low rate of interest and repayable in the local currency. But if a loan is made, the people usually expend it more judiciously because they know they must repay it. Usually they spend it for things that they actually need because they know they must respend it. And usually repay it, and usually they understand a loan, whereas a gift, they think there are political strings attached, even though there are none. So but I'm very much in favor of loans as a rule. But most of the aid that we receive from the United States is in the nature of loans. That's right. As you call it, the soft loans. Any money that is really given as a grant is more for humanitarian health or such purposes That's like right. that. But most of our developmental loans that we get are loans all the same. Well, now, may I, may I again be the devil's advocate here and throw in a jarring note? Uh, I agree with everything that the both of you have said, except to call these uh, 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 transactions loans. Now, I should define what I think of as a loan. A loan to me is something, uh, is a transaction whereby a certain commodity is uh, put out on time, the commodity usually being money, and repaid in kind. Now, in these loans, as you mentioned, Mr. Johnston, uh, dollars are loaned and the repayment is usually made in something else. In the inst uh, instance of India, it would be rupees. Uh, we take those rupees, but we can only do certain things with them. Uh, we can spend them as the, in India as the Indian government agrees that we can spend them. So, uh, to me, this is not a loan. Uh, I'm not against it, but I just don't want the people of the United States to think that this is something which is coming back to the Treasury. Well, it Rogers, probably is not coming back Mr. to Rogers, the Treasury. Mr. Rogers, sometimes it does. Now, let me give you an illustration. I remember the so-called soft loans that we made to Germany after the Second World War. And I don't think anybody felt that the marks would be repaid. Now, the mark is a very hard currency today.
And those loans have been repaid. And if India gets into a position where she is a viable state and has a sound economy with sufficient foreign exchange, I believe that those loans will be repaid in dollars and not in rupees. And there's one more thing, too. India has got uh, several things to export, too. Say, ferromanganese that we have now been exporting in a big way to the United States. But we shall develop our economy in a manner that, like the mark, the rupee also will become an internationally accepted currency where these differences would not stand. In fact, your aid will really help us do that much quicker than otherwise would have been done. Well, I certainly don't want to appear to be less optimistic than you two gentlemen are, and I <laughs> hope that, that what you say is exactly the situation as it occurs in the future. Sometimes but I did, it occurs anyway. That's right. <laughs> But I did want to make it clear that as of now, and under the agreements as they now exist, uh, these loans are repayable in soft currency, and we can't do anything with the currency except in concurrence with the government uh, to which the loan is made. I'd like to ask a specific question about just to what extent foreign aid should be used as a political tool for foreign policy. For instance, recently the Senate suggested to the president that uh, all foreign aid be stopped to the United Arab Republic because until such a time as they allow Israeli shipping to go through the Suez Canal. Now, I think it is a great mistake to use foreign aid as a, uh, as a tool for political purposes. Mr. Rhodes? Well, I would agree. Uh, actually, uh, I don't like the term foreign aid. I'd rather call it mutual security. And if you're going to call it mutual security, well, then I think the question answers itself, that uh, you can't uh, have mutual security without mutual trust. And if this thing has an awful lot of strings attached to it, you'd better not do it in the first place. You'll make more enemies than you will friends. It's a very delicate question for me to <laughs> answer. But surely there should not be political consideration. At the same time, the giver has a right to, you know, just to see as to whom they should give. But surely there can't be any conditions because that won't be self-respecting even for the receiver to do so. Well, Mr. Minister, I have turned in your direction not to obtain an answer to that question, for which I grant you, but to ask you another one, which is how long do you think that India will require continued that's, aid? That's the right question because we have, ourselves are very anxious to see that this period of receiving the aid from others should be as brief as we can make it because according to our self-respect, you know, it's the proper way of doing so. So far as the agriculture is concerned, for which I have come to the states to do something with the administration of the United States, I want to be self-sufficient in agriculture within five years in 1966, which I am sure, I am confident, I will be able to do so. And when agriculture becomes self-sufficient in India, it becomes the basis for the economic growth and for the other things. I do not think more than a period of 10 years from now, not for agriculture, I'm even talking for the industrial and the other sectors, we shall be requiring loans. By that time, we shall have developed our economy and in the period of takeoff and the self-generating economy, which we call it, will come and it will be self-sustaining too. Mr. Patil, has there been a definite, visible, tangible effect of foreign aid on India's economy today? Of course. The impact is so great and it is so demonstrable. For instance, take for my, my agriculture. During the last five years, it has made such demonstrable progress. And it will be so during the next five years when I shall say with confidence that I have turned the corner. And what has been the effect of foreign aid on American economy? Does anybody know? Well, as, as a rule, uh, these dollars come back to us in the form of goods, and we must never forget that most foreign aid is really spent for goods in America to be shipped to the countries involved. And so many American companies receive uh, the dollars, uh, actual dollars that are spent for the goods. So the effect on the American economy has been uh, somewhat stimulating, in my opinion, but uh, the effect we must look at is the long-range effect. Will these nations of the world that are newly emerging into industrial life be able to achieve their industry under a system of freedom of choice or will it not they not be able to do so and in the world where we need friends and where we need help that seems tremendously important to me and in that sc scope I think we have done much better than the average American is willing to give us credit for don't forget that about one out of every four babies born in the world is a Chinaman don't forget that the Soviet bloc have a very large numerical population and don't forget that the free world is very important to stay free and to stay under a system whereby they have a freedom of choice. That's what we want. 
That's what we have armament for in America. It's our main goal that our children and our ch grandchildren can have a system of free choice and other people can have it too. And in that, I think we have made a good deal of progress. Mr. Rhodes? Well, of course, uh, I don't think we have yet determined, or history has yet determined, the effect that this might have on our economy. Uh, we have, by foreign aid and uh, by uh, other devices, I think, built up strong economies in other countries. Many people are saying now that we have done it too fast, that uh, we have created competition for ourselves. Well, I'm not one who believes that that is bad. Uh, in other words, if you don't have competition, I don't think you progress you know, very, very rapidly. So I, it would be my hope that the American economy would be able to, uh, with the competition which we have, progress faster than we had before or than we would have without it. However, if we don't do this, then I would say foreign aid would have had a bad effect upon us. It's up to us to roll up our sleeves and go to work and make sure that that doesn't happen. I think Mr. Roger, Mr. Rhodes is... Uh... ...and I want to congratulate him on his point of view. In my opinion, it's a very sound one. I think that uh, we have made a good deal of progress and will continue to do so and never forget that we always do the biggest trade with those countries that have the highest degree of industrialization, Canada, England, Germany. We never do it with the countries that have a very low degree of industrialization. So industrialization does not hurt our trade. It stimulates it. If we approach the problem correctly and, uh, and resolve even more firmly than before to stay ahead of the game. I think that's true. Mr. Patil, you come from the farthest part, and perhaps you should have the last word. We have only about 30 seconds left. Is there anything that you'd like to tell the American audience? I mean, indeed, very grateful. And on behalf of my people, I would say that whatever the United States has done and has been doing has stimulated our economy. And it will continue to do so. Your president's visit to our country was a great magic. I'm merely saying so because it has helped us. I can't say in so many millions and billions of dollars, but it has brought us so close together because he has appreciated our problem and he exactly knows what our needs are. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Patil, Mr. Johnston, and Mr. Rhodes. You've heard the pros and cons of foreign aid, a program which has lasted already 14 years and seems fated to last a great many years more. It is, as you have heard, an investment in the future, not only our own, but the future of the world. An investment towards freedom, and one would call it a gilt edge invest investment. This is John Secondary. Good afternoon. This has been Open Hearing with your host, John Secondari. Today's guests were Eric Johnston, Chairman of the Committee for International Economic Growth, the Honorable S.K. Patil, Food and Agriculture Minister of India, and Congressman John J. Rhodes, Republican of Arizona. Open Hearing is produced by Helen Jean Rogers. Directed by Herb Victor. Originates in Washington, D.C. and has been a presentation of ABC Public Affairs.